so this is like a follow up. So yesterday we kind of spent the, the afternoon building kind of the common language, right, for all of these types of effects. And so now we're going to kind of take a deep dive uh, to understand them a little better and hopefully answer some of the questions that were brought up yesterday. So, <clears throat> so yesterday we kind of just covered the elastic, quasi elastic and deep and elastic scattering and what we learned from those. And so today we're going to basically build on that by looking at hadrons in the nucleus. We'll be looking at both short and long range dynamics. We'll be looking at that, you know, in in th in thinking of the EMC effect and um, and just by itself. And then we'll also be looking at um, color transparency, specifically in hadronization. Um, so as a review from yesterday, you know, the nuclear strong interaction. It's just this residual basically from the strong interaction between the quarks, right? And so we have kind of this picture that we want to build where we go from a proton and, you know, as we look deeper, you know, whether it's with uh, electron scattering, then we can start to resolve, you know, the constituents of the proton and how that works. And so, you know, with elastic scattering, we get the form factors and we can start to say things about uh, the radius. With quasi-elastic scattering, we can start to say things about shell structure and the momentum distributions, and we can talk about short-range correlations. And then with deep and elastic scattering, we can look at the quark parton picture. And of course, we saw with the EMC effects, which was, you know, determined using deep and elastic scattering, that there's kind of some modifications there to the quark distributions that we don't quite uh, understand, you know, when you compare uh, a bound versus a free nucleon. Okay, so our summary for elastic uh, scattering. So um, these kind of, I felt like these were like two representative plots out of what we discussed yesterday, right? So we have these form factors, which are just the Fourier transforms of the distributions. We could even use the form factors to extract things like the radius. So as we talked about yesterday, the PRAD experiment here was the, the most recent to do it with electron proton scattering. and um, I think there's a part two planned of the experiment already. So this tells us about the structure of the nucleons and the nuclei. Um, Quasi-elastic, we know that the nuclei are complicated, So, but we also found that the Fermi gas model works reasonably well to give us basically the general um, spectra of you know, what, uh, what the quasi-elastic scattering cross-sections uh, look like. And so, so the Fermi gas model works pretty well. Um, we also know that we have scaling, which refers to the dependence of the cross-section on a single variable, and Y scaling is what works well in um, quasi-elastic scattering. And, you know, and then you can expect that you would also have X scaling when you're looking at quarks. So indications that nucleons are not all qu truly quasi-free, so this sort of this first hint that there's modifications inside the nucleus come from potential violations of the Coulomb sum rule that we talked about. And then, of course, there was the loss of spectroscopic strength in the orbitals, which tells us that our nice picture of, um, of the shell model isn't you know, the complete picture, right? So we found that there is, so if you look at the nucleon density as a function of the momentum, we know that there's you know, this huge strength in the nucleus of these mean field nucleons swimming around. And now we know that there's this huge uh, kind of high momentum tail uh, above the Fermi momentum. Okay, and then summarizing the deep and elastic scattering summary. So we can describe deep and elastic scattering using structure functions, which contain the quark momentum density type information. And we look at this in the context of the quark parton model. And then lastly, of course, we have the EMC effect, which just is simply the loss of momentum carried by the valence quarks and the bound nucleons relative to a free nucleon. And that was measured by comparing the F2 and uh, F2 structure functions for um, a heavy nucleus relative to deuterium, or uh, it could also be just a ratio of the cross sections, right? So we see this huge dip here in this region, 0.3 to 0.7, where we know that we're kind of dominated by the valence quarks. So, um, so that's where we left there. So just taking a step back and talking about kind of the principles of how these experiments go. So we have sort of our theory or model type of predictions or input, right? And it has certain assumptions associated with that. We design our experiments. So we design things, we choose things like beam energy, we choose things like the kinematics, 
And we can make smart decisions about the kinematics if we have some idea of, you know, it's going to minimize other types of reactions, right? Um, but the thing we, the only thing we really measure, right, is we're really just counting events. So we can count events, we can count events and know the angles that are associated with them, where they ended up in the phase space. Um, but that's really all we're actually measuring, right? So then we can reconstruct uh, the events. So we can reconstruct the interaction point, for example, and what we think happened at the moment of interaction. So if we are working in plane wave impulse approximation, then we're you know, tracing things back to what that nucleon was doing in the nucleus when it was struck. And then we have the physics interpretation. So how does this support basically our model and assumptions? And so as you kind of, you begin with a theory or idea or a prediction, and as you work your way down, I mean, the only thing really that's kind of independent here is what you measure. And then you start to add on layers of either models or assumptions uh, in your extraction of the physics. And so when we study these types of reactions, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but we have inclusive reactions where in a lot of cases we can learn a lot just from just scatter, just measuring the scattered electron, right? So you can have the electron comes in and interacts. I guess you could just imagine this is just a giant box. It interacts somehow, and then you can just measure the scattered electron. And already you have, um, you already have uh, X and Q squared from that alone, right? So then you can have a semi-inclusive reaction where you detect the electron in some hadron that was produced. Um, and then you can also have exclusive reactions where you detect uh, everything. So, um, and sometimes we kind of use the term, I guess a little bit broadly because we don't always, right? We're not always measuring like the recoiled, uh, the recoiled nucleus, but we would still call that in many cases, you'll still hear that called oftentimes an exclusive reaction because we're measuring all the nuclei, the nucleons that came out of the reaction. So even if you're missing like the recoil nucleus, it's still an exclusive reaction. Okay, and so I added these details here. This is kind of more for your notes because this is something that always seems to complicate people from time to time when they're asked, um, just in calculating luminosity, right? So when we're talking about luminosity, we're talking about event rates uh, experimentally. And so, um, you can have the electron beam luminosity where you just take the beam current. So if you're sitting on shift and you're saying, I want 40 microamps on carbon, then you know you have your beam current divided by your, your charge and you get your number of electrons per second. And then you can have your target luminosity, which is based then um, on your number of particles in a unit area, okay? So you have your density times the length of that target and then you can have your A and your Avogadro's number, right, to get the number of nucleons, for example, per square centimeter. And it's just the multiplication of these two factors that would give you the total integrated luminosity. So these numbers generally are something like on the order for a Hall, um, Hall A or Hall C experiment, you can talk about something on like 10 to the 37, right, so pretty high. And I think, I think like Hall B is on the order of like 10 to... 36, close to around there, I think op optimally right now. Maybe you can compare to Kera that we talked about this morning and that was 10 to the 32. Right, yeah. There you go. So yeah, so that's, so, and then you can calculate an event rate. So if you're sitting down and somebody's asked you to say like, you know, uh, you're trying to figure out what kind of, what your background rate going to be on, you know, or what your, desired event rate is for a certain type of reaction, then you know you would be able to scale this by your luminosity and your cross-section probability. Okay, so then, you know, in nuclear physics, so we have our kind of our elevator pitch, right? So what holds the nucleus together? That's really that's just the question that we're trying to answer. Um, and so you know we kind of begin with most of our most of our picture, I, I guess I call it our real world or our physical picture, right? It's sort of this um, exchange of mesons that we can describe you know, via Yukawa potential. Um, but then you have quantum chromodynamics, which is basically the leading theory of the strong force, which uses quark and gluon degrees of freedom carrying color charge. And so you know, we have the potential between the nucleons. So we discussed this part yesterday. So if you have the potential here and the distance between them, the distance of separation, you know, nucleons are overlapping here and they're repulsive, right? The, and then nucleons are at, kind of long range here and they're exchanging a meson here. And so, um, you know, there's the repulsive core, the attractive potential between the nucleons and, you know, everything's colorless matter. So 
the quark interactions themselves individually cancel at these long distances, right? So, um, but the QCD potential is quite different, right? So at very, very, very short distances or high energies, we use perturbative QCD. And so you can you know, assume that it, everything's like asymptotically free. And, but as you basically separate two quarks, then the potential gets um, you know, more strongly, more str stronger. <laughs> And so that's where you can start to generate, that's where ultimately they use the rubber band description where if you kind of stretch a rubber band enough, it breaks into two, right? And then you have, you have the quarks hadronized basically from this energy. And so the idea is here, we have our real world, which describes, which is kind of well described anyways by our potential between nucleons. But then there's all these hints and um, elements coming from these quark and gluon degrees of freedom which we kind of call our QCD land. And so somewhere we want to find a nice description that really well, you know, that connects both of these worlds. Because as of yesterday, we kind of found a few different areas in our, you know, gaps in our understanding anyways. We start to describe things in terms of nucleons and mesons, but there's still something we don't understand about the quarks and gluons and their contributions, right? So that's really what we want to do is we want to find a way to describe real world and QCD land connecting them. And there's a few different ways to do it. So, um, we so we basically the two kind of main paths that we can take, right, is we can look at modifications in the structure and in the interactions of hadrons in the nucleus, and that's a very popular avenue, right? So that's kind of the first that's the first area I'll talk about is where we can look for these kinds of clues, and then the second area I'll talk about will be the transition, looking for the direct transition from quark gluon degrees of freedom to nucleon mesonic degrees of freedom. So we'll start back with what we were talking about yesterday with the EMC effect. And so, you know, this was observed using deep and elastic scattering and it, you know, the effect. So the region of interest is, in, is this 0.3 to 0.7. This is the F2 structure functions or the cross-section ratio. Of, and this was the original result. So this was, or the original nuclei. So this was um, iron over deuterium. And so the expectation is that it should be relatively flat, right? Um, and the reality was, is it was, um, there's a big slope here. And so the slope is something, that's a handle that we use as we try to understand like the magnitude of the EMC effect and its relation to other things. But the effect increases with A. So, you know, the heavier nuclei, nuclei you'll see have steeper slopes. It's um, relatively Q squared independent. And so, um, but you know, it's sort of universally observed for all nuclei in this region. So, and at the the bottom line is is that the cross section per nucleon and nuclei is not the same as that off a of free nucleon. So there's a lot of different models for the EMC effect. I won't go through all of these, but there's kind of some leading ideas, right? Is that you can have, um, so you can have it such that the nucleon structure is modified. So you can have the idea of this swollen uh, nucleon. So if um, if the confinement anyways is related to the to the density, um, then you would kind of say that if if it, you know, if it's swollen, then you would have this deconfinement anyways of the valence um, quarks. And so there's where you would have that loss of the um, loss of the momentum that they're carrying. You can have multi-quark clusters, which is this idea that instead of just three quark color singlets, you could have six, nine, or twelve something much higher and then they would spend more time interacting with each other and overlapping in these distributions and causing uh, some of the things that we see with the EMC effect. There's dynamical rescaling, which is an interesting uh, thought because that's saying that, um, for example, that the nucleus of iron, right, it looks like deuterium with much, much higher Q squared because you're seeing more of the constituents inside. So then there's a whole uh, avenue of, of, of analysis that you can do there to do like a, like a rescaling variable to try to understand um, to try to understand that, but none of these things by themselves really explain that and other things. So that's the problem. Um, and then it seems remiss if you don't include some of the um, multinucleon effects, right? So there's the binding uh, energy and the Fermi momentum that we have to include if we're going to explain. Uh, there's nuclear pions, so we know that mesons. That we, we know that nucleons are held together right by the exchange of mesons. So the idea here is that 
uh, you know, maybe in certain ranges of X, I mean, it's expected in certain ranges of X that you would have um, basically a loss of what you're measuring because you would be losing some of the momentum to the meson exchanges. Um, as so that would so if that varies with x, then you would have some kind of a slope induced, right? And so that doesn't induce some slope effect. And then I'll talk about we we'll kind of have to build up to this picture, but basically how the effect of and then short range correlations to two nucleons overlapping can also support uh, you know descriptions of the EMC effect. So it's clear that nucleon modification something is needed to describe the data. And so what's shown here on the right is, um, you know, three different nuclei, so carbon, beryllium, and helium-4 as over the deuterium, right? So this is just the standard EMC uh, ratio. And so you have the full calculation, and you have it, in this dashed line here is just nuclear effects only, which is just your Fermi motion and binding energy. So you can see in none of these cases that that can account for everything. Um, but the full calculation then includes some considerations for nucleon modification, um, basically off shellness or um, yeah, changes to the bound nucleon structure functions for the virtuality and then nuclear pions and shadowing considerations. So, so you, they can replicate these things, but these, um, these models aren't the complete uh, description. So there were follow-up experiments uh, at SLAC that were kind of immediately done in the after, immediately, maybe a little bit delayed, but they were done pretty soon after the official observation of the EMC effect. And so one of the experiments we looked at there, we looked at, we saw that they measured these um, nuclei yesterday. These are light nuclei. And so the resulting picture that they were able to put together is that they could take the EMC slope, which I said was kind of this uh, variable that they extract right from the experiment. And then they plotted this EMC slope for each of these nuclei uh, versus the scaled nuclear density. So this is the average density for the nuclei. And so, um, you know, right away you kind of notice that beryllium-9 sits way out from helium-4 and carbon-12. And that was kind of a confusing result because um, beryllium-9 and helium-4 and carbon should all have pretty similar um, nuclear effects going on. So the idea is, is that with beryllium-9, is it kind of looks like a, like a, like a dumbbell with, <laughs> with a neutron attached to it. So it's two alpha particles, right? So it has a lower um, density, uh, but then it became important. It became clear from this plot, the conclusion then moving forward was that the local density is what's really important. So then basically there was kind of a follow-up uh, later on, which was sort of the next major correlation between these observations, which was that, well, we know that short range correlations, which we started to talk about yesterday and we'll talk a whole bunch more about today, um, that they're related to the local density. Right, and so the EMC effect seems to correlate well with the local density, and so that led people to start looking at um, the correlation of the EMC effect and number of nucleons, nucleon pairs. So short range number nucleons probability basically being a short range correlation. So this is a very expanded plot of what we've looked at before, right? So where you have iron over deuterium, you have this EMC slope, which looks super tiny on this plot because of the way it's plotted. So what people do is they take measurements, uh, inclusive scattering. So just measuring the scattered electron going out to very high X, okay, where you can think of, you know, X greater than one, you can start to think of the fact that the, so X greater than one is really only accessible, right, in a bound nucleus. And it's where you would expect that the struck kind of quark is carrying a lot more momentum than, um, than just like a nucleon at rest. And so you start to have, you know, this, it has this kind of characteristic climb and then it plateaus. And so the idea of where the plateau is is that you're just looking at um, pairs of nucleons, okay? So then they define this factor called A2 and you can think of A2 as kind of for now, you can think of it as like a probability of, you know, a nucleon in iron 56 to be in a short range correlated pair at high momentum. And so they, they take this A2 factor for different nuclei because it changes with the heavy nucleus. Uh, they plot A2 down here, okay, so for various nuclei. And then you can look again at this slope from the EMC effect. And what they saw was that things line up pretty well, right? So this is related again back to our, our discussion of the local density. So these things line up 
pretty well where kind of deuterium, of course, is where you, you anchor things and then you take everything relative to that, but you can measure this effect. So this was important and it got people thinking really hard about, you know, about spending a lot more time understanding short range correlations. And so the question kind of becomes, is the EMC effect related to just the high momentum nucleons? Um, and are all the high momentum nucleons, are they the ones that modified, right? And we'll ask this question, you know, we'll kind of examine things and we can even ask this question a little bit differently. Um, so, but at this point we can start to revisit the NN short range correlated pairs concepts. This is the same slide I showed yesterday, right? So we're talking about overlapping pairs and high relative momentum. Okay. And so the kinematics that we can think of, so in most reactions, we go to X greater than one kinematics. Um, so which is much more sensitive to these high momentum um, nucleons. And so you have, you know, your electron probe, which comes in and scatters with some nucleon that you're going to knock out. So this is all kind of nucleon knockout type of reactions in electron scattering. And then you have your scattered electron. So we measure the scattered electron. And if you just measure that, that's your EE prime. But uh, in many cases, if you want to know SRC structure, then you have to measure uh, the knocked out nucleon, okay? And in some cases, you could even measure its pair, right? So if it was in a pair, if it was like a proton and a neutron that were in a pair, you can measure both. Um, so that's another option. And then, so, but at a minimum anyways, we, this, we kind of reconstruct things, um, you know, as I talked about yesterday, uh, in plane wave impulse approximation. So you reconstruct things, you measure the scattered electron and you measure the lead, I call it the lead nucleon. So it could be the proton or neutron that you knocked out. And then you can reconstruct the missing momentum, missing mass, missing energy. And um, you know that's according to these equations down here, right? So the missing mass then you reconstruct kind of assuming scattering on like a, like a stationary deuteron pair. And it works pretty well because even in data, you know, we can see that we have a nice peak where the neutron uh, should be, right? So in a missing missing mass type of reaction. So how do we look for these SRCs? So I've kind of already answered this, uh, but you know, we look at x greater than one. We can learn about it from EE prime scattering, which tells us about probabilities then that the nucleons in a uh, like a two nucleon. Um, short range correlation. And hypothetically, if you go even higher, you can see three nucleon short range correlations, which are not experimentally observed yet, but a lot of people are thinking about it. And then you could also use Deuteron, which is really great system because it's kind of the simply simplest nucleus you can have that has pairing going on, right? And so you can just do Deuteron breakup essentially and measure everything. And that's also another reason why in a lot of um, a lot of experiments, of course, we're comparing everything to the deuteron, right? Because it's just it's just the simplest PN pair. And then you can uh, measure this. So you can measure, as I said, you can measure just the knocked out nucleon, or you can measure the nucleon pair, right, from the reaction. And so this all probes then the detailed structure of the short range correlations. Okay, so then we talked about yesterday, so where does this not always work? And so, um, you know, there's different types of kinematics that you can choose. I mean, it's all quasi-elastic scattering essentially, but the perpendicular kinematics are not always sensitive to the full momentum distribution. So this was um, some of the earlier data that was taken on helium-3, where at, they took it basically right at X equals one. And so they have kind of their data and a pretty large deviation as they went out to high missing momentum uh, from the plane wave impulse approximation picture. And so this is just due to, um, you know, a lot of other competing processes kind of uh, being difficult to disentangle from that type of measurement. So, but if we want to measure this type of picture, then we can, we can choose kinematics that will help us to kind of achieve our goal. So um, we can go to high Q squared. So we want to go to high Q squared. This reduces the contributions from meson exchange currents. So meson exchange currents are shown here where your virtual photon interacts with um, the virtual particle being exchanged between uh, your nucleons. And then you can go out to X greater than one. So we go into anti-parallel kinematics to reduce the contributions from isobar configurations, which is where you sort of, uh, you excite this nucleon and then it 
basically rescatters off your other nucleon. And so all these are effects that could look a lot like they, they'll pass everything that when you try to select on your short range correlated uh, events, but they're just backgrounds, right? Um, so then we can also minimize competing processes of, of just the final state interactions. So we have, we have to consider the final state interactions between the pair of nucleons. So after you've interacted with them, if they are rescattering uh, between each other before um, exiting the nucleus, or final state interactions with, um, with the nucleus itself. And so, uh, so from here, we can make kind of kinematic selections, right? So we can choose like the angle between the nucleon and the Q vector, and we can minimize that angle because you know, we have a pretty good picture of what this looks like. So this is calculated for um, helium three EE prime P. And so what you have is this angle that I described, right? And so you have um, different uh, missing momenta. And so what you see anyways, is that, you know, for, for 200 MeV, it's kind of mostly flat when you describe the difference between uh, the cross section and the plane wave impulse approximation. And then as you go to higher missing momentum, you get lots of final state interaction effects. So that's why it's so different. So then what we can do is we can choose to go to angles anyways, that basically these effects are just minimized. It's not a problem. Okay, and then, so the nice picture to always describe this that you, know, you can always take with you, I think, is that, so we have what's below the Fermi momentum, which is you know, well-described kind of in terms of the mean field that we talked about yesterday. And so you have in an asymmetric nucleus, right? You'll have, let's just talk about a, a neutron heavy nucleus because that's what most of them are. So you have the majority of nucleons then are um, your neutrons and you have this minority that's protons, right? And so if these were people at a dance party or something like that, then the idea is, is that if only, um, you know, if only, if let's say if the minority is male and the majority is female, then you know, if only male and females were dancing together at this dance party, then as you go to the high uh, momentum tail, then you know they kind of start to have equal contributions here because of well, we'll talk about this later, but because of the tensor, um, the tensor component, and so the fact that they populate this tail then changes kind of the um, the amount that we see in the mean field spectrum. So a lot of these studies actually started with, uh, a lot of the more recent studies anyways, like a slew of them came out of class data. And so a lot of them were actually even done after the class data was taken. This was taken um, years ago and a lot of people are doing data mining and finding all sorts of new things because they took these experiments on nuclear targets, which means they took them on copper and lead and heavier targets. And so this is the class detector, right? It's like a big onion. And those are all the detectors on the outside. And so you have this electron incident, the electron beam comes in and interacts with the target, and then you'll have your scattered electron. So again, this is all just in the lab kind of picture of things. So you have your scattered electron, and then you'll have either your knocked out proton or even your knocked out neutron that you could see, okay, in these detectors. And so, um, so what was really nice about these experiments was that we had several different targets to, that uh, these experiments were taken from. And so you can basically make selections on the data to look at things in terms of what came from mean field and what came from a high momentum um, tail. And so what the kind of the early observations are anyways is that the NP neutron proton pairs dominate. Um, so these are comparisons. So on the right, let's start with on the right. So this is all just carbon, okay? So this is all one nucleus. And so what they observe is that if you measure the PP, so the, the like a proton-proton pair in the nucleus versus neutron-proton pairs in the nucleus, uh, you get like a factor of almost 20 between them, okay? So these are the, out of the things in the high momentum tail that occupy um, short range correlated pairs, about 5% are from PP and, and nearly all the rest are from the neutron-proton. And neutron neutron wasn't shown on here because they just didn't um, detect it at that time. So then you can, so then the studies were done, as I mentioned in the class uh, experiments where they went back with um, all these different kinds of nuclei, okay, carbon, aluminum, iron, and lead. And they were able to basically confirm the same kind of thing was sort of universal to all the nuclei. Uh, 
right? So they didn't really seem to vary um, significantly, at least within the uncertainties, that from this picture, that we were kind of overwhelmingly dominated um, by NP pairing. And so the idea then is, is that in an asymmetric nucleus, that your, that your protons, which are the minority nucleon in that case, because they're more likely to pair in this high momentum tail, they sort of speed up, right? Because they're always kind of the chosen guy to, uh, to pair with. And so, um, so they speed up and then they occupy, and then that's what kind of um, you see in this tail versus a symmetric nucleus. So this would be like the density distribution for protons. And we have evidence of this again from the same experiments with a lot of data mining. So they take the minority proton um, that moves faster than the majority, um, than the majority, which is the neutrons, the neutron rich nuclei. So what you can do is you can construct these ratios. So you construct what's called the high momentum fraction. So you take uh, basically your observation of uh, a proton or neutron in a high, in the short range correlation, so in the high momentum tail, and you compare it to one in the mean field, so your observation of those. And then we take the double ratio because a lot of things cancel and it makes it a lot easier. So you take the double ratio with, a, with respect to a symmetric nucleus, right? So carbon's easy because it's just six protons, six neutrons. And so then you compare these and you can start to see that basically your neutrons um, kind of always stay flat, right? So, but the high momentum tail then you start to see that the protons themselves are always kind of relative, you know, as kind of a function of like N over Z, they're basically occupying this high momentum tail because they're always the desired uh, partner for pairing because of this NP dominance. And so then you can do the direct measurement, basically comparing the neutron and proton um, uh, observations that you see in these nuclei. And so if you, measure, so this is the cross-section ratio between a neutron and a proton in the same nucleus, okay? So you have carbon, aluminum, iron, and lead. So then here you're looking in the pink is the high momentum. And you basically see it's pretty flat around one because all your NP pairs, as we said, are mostly it's, if you find a neutron in the high momentum tail, you find a proton. And in your low momentum part, then you start to see um, basically, again, kind of a similar trend with this N over Z for the low momentum. So that was very interesting observation. So then you can come and you can, so as I said, with short range correlated pairs, um, you know, it's small uh, center of mass um, momentum and high relative momentum, right? So this small center of mass uh, momentum means that there's just a small separation between those pairs. And so that's why, that's why we're looking at that. So, so then, yeah, so, they have small center of mass, so this is a small separation between the pairs. And so what they were able to observe, again, this is the same kind of data. There's a lot of things you can do with this data. So you can take, um, they were able to basically show that with just a 3D Gaussian, which is kind of at least part of it what's shown down here, the descriptions in X and Y are here. It looks like it's, it's consistent anyways with the sum of an overlapping two mean field nucleons. So that was really um, interesting anyways to plot the center of mass um, momentum. And then you can take that the, so then you can basically say, you can start to say, if you have the set, the width of this distribution shown up here, right, versus A, so for the nucleons, then they, they started to basically say that you might be able to, at least theory would predict, that you should be able to say something um, about how the SRC pairs are formed um, in different specific quantum states. And so this this work doesn't show what that is, but it does say that you know if you take if you take data specifically for that, you should be able to um, to see that trend, which would be really interesting. And so for high nucleon momenta, you know this is this is um, a factorized uh, calculation. So this is the momentum density um, at versus the momentum. Again, think of like missing momentum. And so what you can say is that no matter what the nucleus, anyways, in the tail, they might have different um, strengths, right? But that the shapes are all the same. And so you could then think that you could probably write some sort of a, a type of scaling relation for this. And so again, we see with the inclusive data and, and that basically as you go to very high X, so X greater than 1.5 or so, 
then you start to have what's, what's called the SRC sort of scaling regime. And so this is where you extract these A2 uh, values, which then you can say is like the probability of a nucleon being in a, in a pair. So you could write an effective theory for short range correlations. And so you can take the many, the many body um, wave function and write it as two body wave function and the A minus two residual system. You can use what's now called the generalized contact formalism, which takes basically, which uses two body densities. So you can take basically a two body density here. So this could be, um, so this is for NN. So it could be PP, NP or NN, right? Or it could be um, uh, the sum of all of them. And then you have basically a nucleus dependent contact term, which we can extract from data. So this would tell you, um, we can extract from, from data for the nucleus what this contact term would be. And you can multiply it then by a two body universal and then like potential basically. So this interaction. And so what's really nice about that is then it just means that the only thing that you have to worry about is this uh, extracted contact term to determine what your abundance is gonna be for your, for your pairs. And so it was shown anyways, that if you write it this way, you can have both um, at small r, so small separation distances. So on this side of the plot, right? So this is the, con this is the density for PN pairs for a, a nucleus, for any of these nuclei. Um, they all basically can line up, right? So using these contact terms. And then similarly, it's shown that basically at large momentum, um, you have kind of crazy stuff happening down here, but you have basically where they all line up at, uh, at the large momentum. So anyways, the point is that you can make an effective, um, an effective description of short range correlations that's relevant at small distances and high momentum, which is where they're relevant, right? And then you can make predictions based on that, uh, which is really useful. So this is the, gen again, the generalized contact formalism, we can compare it to data. So you have uh, helium four EE prime P scattering, which is what's shown by all these red points in these top three plots, and they have increasing missing momentum, right? Um, and so, and these are functions of missing energy. And so what's really interesting is that, you know, they just showed two different NN potentials here. So they use AV18, which is very common, and then chiral um, perturbation theory next to next to leading order, uh, which is also a pretty common uh, choice. And so they showed that basically with, with those choices that you, you could use the GCF to reasonably describe the shapes of the data. And so you can do the same with something like um, EE prime PN, right? So there's a lot less data here. So the data is a little poorer here because neutrons are hard uh, to extract um, for these measurements. But again, this worked reasonably well um, in data. So then what else could you do with it? So, uh, you know, most recently uh, there's some demonstration anyways that you can have, um, that you can use basically this concept of X scaling for EE prime P. So here they take X from, um, a range of 0.7 to 1.8, and you can look at the missing momentum. So these are all the different nuclei again. And you can see the points in green are the data. And you can basically see that there's mean field calculations. And so I think the exciting part to me about seeing this really was that the data minus the mean field anyways shows that really this missing, this Fermi momentum is kind of right around 300 or so. And after that, you know, if you make that selection, then over here, you look very good for selecting stuff that's at the high momentum tail and it's, and it's looks like it's scaling between these nucleons. So that's really, really interesting. And then also there were comparisons that were made. So these are, this is data that's compared to the generalized contact formalism model using again, the same two um, potentials. And so this is carbon. Right, and so what they're doing here is they're actually mapping. This is this is so um, this is cool to see. So they map basically the short range, uh, the, the tensor basically attraction. And so what you can see is that this um, so you have E E prime P P over E E prime P, and then you have P N over P, and you can basically map these. So you see that the you go from an isospin dependent tensor N N um, interaction at the low missing momentum to an isospin dependent scalar interaction at the high missing momentum. So that was um, really interesting to see. 
And so one of the leading one of the lead experiments that we did in kind of recent years then to follow up, because um, as I mentioned, a lot of these studies right, were done on heavy nuclei. And so what we always want to do is we want to benchmark ourselves with the lighter nuclei because we still want to connect those pictures. If you can calculate things in the light nuclei, then in principle, you can always calculate things for the heavier nuclei, but that we're still working on that, right? So it's like, it's kind of, uh, it's why we take so much data and then we're trying to analyze and understand it and interpret it phenomenologically because it might give us insights then on how to, um, on, on how we can understand um, the heavier nuclei and of course, huge systems ultimately. So one of the big things we did in Hall A was we had a tritium target, which was uh, nice because you can compare tritium um, to helium-3, you can compare it to deuterium, so your simplest pairing, and you can start to say things about protons and neutrons and how they act in the different uh, in these different settings. And so you can say, uh, so in this case, we had basically our electron beam on our tritium target. And again, this is like a, a knockout reaction, right? So you measure a scattered electron, scattered proton, and this is kind of a standard type of spectrometer type of experiment in the sense that things go into uh, your spectrometer and you just measure basically tracks and you have particle identification, right? And you just read those things out. So these were the tritium experiments. And so what we were able to do then is because you can essentially set uh, you know, your spectrometer locations to have a high missing momentum setting. So you're looking at these particles coming from high missing momentum or SRCs and your low missing momentum or your mean field. And so this was the first simultaneous measurement in a single experiment done on helium-3, um, tritium, and deuterium. And so we were able to do things like um, obtain basically kind of a, a general good agreement anyways of the helium-3 neutron spectral function uh, as shown here. So we kind of just do that by um, assuming that you have some you know, isospin symmetry between uh, the helium-3 and the tritium. And then you can take these ratios um, relative to deuterium and make uh, comparisons to plane wave impulse approximation, which is what was done here. So you always notice when an experiment comes out, particularly, uh, well, most experiments actually, they always publish ratios first, right? Because it's like the easiest thing, all these things cancel. You don't have to worry about overall normalization, which is the really hard part. And so, um, so this was the first result, but again, it was kind of confusing, right? Because if this is the plane wave impulse approximation simulation, it would tell you that there's something kind of serious that you don't quite, that you're not quite replicating in the data that you don't quite understand. Um, and so you have to kind of dig a little bit deeper into the data to understand. So, you know, in a very naive model anyways, you would have helium three um, to tritium ratio, and you would think that it's just simple nucleon counting. So we're only, again, I said, we're only detecting the protons in this case, right? So if we're only detecting the protons at simple nucleon counting, then you would think that, you know, while you're at mean field, you're counting two protons, you know, um, in helium three relative to the tritium. And you would think down here, then you would think because of NP dominance that it's gonna be the same. And so the picture again was kind of consistent with what we saw the first time was that we have a fairly good description down at this low missing momentum. But as we go to a higher missing momentum, things start to deviate from the picture as we understand it. And so it was kind of um, really digging into data that you have to consider um, single charge exchange, right? So single charge exchange is a big, um, it's an important correction that you have to do when you're doing these proton neutron type counting experiments from knockout. So in this case, uh, you can plot basically the experimental cross-section compared to a calculation of the cross-section, including FSIs. So here what they saw was that the you know, tritium starts to go down and the helium-3 starts to go up. So that was our best clue, right? That there was something, um, that there was something within the single charge exchange anyways that we don't understand. And so then you can construct basically the sum of these two things and you would be insensitive, more insensitive to the effects of that. And so in, in that case, you basically have to do corrections because in your helium-3, um, you're going to knock out a neutron sometimes that's going to hit a proton and increase your EE prime P. And you'll have the opposite effect in the tritium. And that's why this one's going to go down and the helium-3 is going to go up. So that's why this was a, kind of an important um, thing to learn about and explore because it was really the first time that these kinds of measurements have been done. And so there's actually a second part of this experiment that will happen in class 12. So instead of just doing spectrometer type of experiments, you do the whole 
full onion, right? And you get a lot more information and um, should be able to access much higher um, missing momentum there as well. So we can do, we can learn a lot of things about the nucleon dynamics anyways with the short range correlations. Um, Why don't we stop? I guess we should stop here maybe, and then we can um, ask questions and, okay. That's for me, that's for me smearing, I think that's gonna cause everything above this 0.7. There's other effects. So there's a lot of effects on this that we're not talking about, right? There's a shadowing region, there's an anti-shadowing region, and there's the Fermi uh, motion region. And so they all have, that's why we kind of confine ourselves when we're talking about EMC to this 0.3 to 0.7, because that was really believed to be this stable region where you're just in, you're just worried about then you're up and down like your valence quarks, basically, those contributions. So that's why we don't really talk much about the stuff at the high X side. Yeah, so he's asking about why this blue line, why the blue, which is more insensitive, right, to the effects of single charge exchange, but why it still has kind of an upward slope, right? And so you're still coming out. You can see that this is still really like a good kind of transition region, right? So these points down here are still at sort of this transition region going into high missing momenta. So it's thought anyways that if you were to kind of do a better job with the measurements and see them go all the way out, you should see it flattened all the way out. Yeah. It's the reason the N we have NP pairs, right, that dominate. So versus PP or NN, right? So isospin, right? So there, you basically, it's, you have, the tensor interaction part of the wave function, and you have, you know, the non-tensor parts. So you would have PP and NN, and then you can have NP pairing, basically. So, and this is the preferred. So in this region, right, this transition region, as we go from, uh, as we go to smaller and smaller distance of nucleon separation, then we're starting to look at in this region where they prefer if they're pairing that they're going to be an NP pairs. Uh, so there was a Hall A measurement, which was done here, where they actually set out. Um, I have to, I can't remember. I can't remember exactly why that's different. So they have PP over NP. So I think one's inferred um, from from the fraction. And so, but then these ones, they were able to basically go back and measure because you can measure in class, right? You can measure neutrons, you can measure, and they did. Um, and so they could find agreement between these. And so I think, so this is the only, so this, they kind of use this one as a benchmark because carbon is a symmetric nucleus and it was taken in two different experimental setups and they roughly agree within the, um, They roughly agree, basically. So it's kind of a benchmark. But then, and they were able with class, able to go with the heavier nuclei. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 